Welcome to my video on inhaled nitric oxide. I'm Mike Cheney. I'm a respiratory therapist. Today, we're going to cover part one, which is the basics of inhaled nitric oxide. If you're interested in learning more about setup and troubleshooting, you can check out my YouTube channel that also has other respiratory care topics in it. So let's get started. First, let's talk about what nitric oxide is. It is a colorless, odorless gas and our cells actually make it to help regulate blood pressure. Um, and it, they make it from dietary sources that include green leafy vegetables, beets, broccoli, walnuts, seafood, lean meat, and wine. And now let's talk about what it is not. It is not nitrous oxide, which is N2O, and that is a product used in race cars to make them go really fast. It's also an anesthetic used at the dentist office. It is also not uh, to be confused with nitric acid, which is created, as you can see here, when combustion pollution mixes with moisture in the air. And it's also known as acid rain. So as you can see in this picture, our blood vessels use nitric oxide to cause smooth muscle relaxation, which helps regulate blood pressure, as we said earlier. It also reduces platelet aggregation, which helps with circulatory health. And finally, it's released by mediators in the uh, immune and inflammatory response, which uh, you can see here, this is an exhaled nitric oxide monitor and we can use that to determine if there is an inflammation going on in the airway. And that's used to see if uh, there's a presence of airway inflammation to determine if somebody is, uh, if their asthma is controlled. It's colorless, odorless, as we said before, and it actually won molecule of the year in 1992, which is kind of an odd award, but it won nonetheless. And it was approved by the FDA uh, for medical use in 1999. Medically, nitric oxide is part of a group of drugs called nitrates, and all of these cause vasodilation. So drugs uh, of this type would be uh, like nitroglycerin used for chest pain because of its tendency to dilate the coronary arteries. Viagra used for its vasodilating properties, nitroprusside, which is given to vaso vasodilate and lower blood pressure during a hypertensive crisis. The problem is that if we were to give a nitrate drug like nitroprusside to improve pulmonary blood flow, and which would improve VQ matching, a few undesirable things would happen. First, if the only thing you want to do is improve VQ matching, given that an IV drug if you give that uh, nitroprusside IV, it would cause systemic vasodilation all over, which would drop your patient's blood pressure, which is not a desirable effect because really we just want it to take effect in the lungs. The second bad thing is that it goes to all the blood vessels and it would cause vasodilation in unventilated lung units that may be collapsed or full. Increasing blood flow to unventilated units causes shunting and that will actually worsen oxygenation. And <clears throat> also the half-life of nitric oxide is very short, somewhere between oh, 30 and 50 seconds. So it, if you gave it IV, it might not even make it to the lungs before it is no longer effective. So how do we deliver it directly to the lungs so it doesn't affect the rest of the body? And how do we deliver it so it affects only ventilated units and not unventilated ones? Well, we deliver it via the inhalation route. That way it only enters the ventilated units. As you can see here, the one on the right is ventilated and the one on the left is not, it's full of stuff. So then if uh, it only enters the ventilated units, then it'll only dilate the blood vessels of those ventilated units, as you can see here. So that's why sometimes we call nitric oxide a selective vasodilator. It only goes to the ventilated units, therefore only dilates the capillaries of those ventilated units and causes VQ matching. As you can see on the one on the left, if we were to dilate that side, 
it would just push more blood flow to an unventilated unit and it wouldn't pick up oxygen. And because it's got a really short half-life, it creates this action right there immediately uh, on the one on the right. Improving pulmonary blood flow also reduces pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, this reduces pulmonary hypertension and reduces workload to the right heart. Okay, so let's talk about how we actually give it to the patient um, through the inhalation route. Um, we give it through what's called an inhaled nitric oxide delivery system or INO system. The one pictured here is the uh, INO max system, and the INO system gets placed in line with a ventilator circuit and delivers a specific preset nitric oxide dose to the patient. The reason we have to use a big high-tech system for delivery instead of just bleeding it in is because if we were to bleed in a fixed nitric oxide flow into the vent circuit, the dose would vary with changes in the patient's minute ventilation. In other words, every time the respiratory rate or tidal volume change, the dose of nitric oxide would change. So think about, you know, you have a fixed flow of nitric, but as minute ventilation changes, it will make that dose proportionately less or more depending on if the ventilation is increasing or decreasing. Same principle applies to like low flow oxygen delivery. For example, if you place a patient on a two liter nasal cannula, their minute ventilation goes up, then the delivered uh, FiO2 goes down because the two liters gets diluted out by the extra room air that's pulled in from the increase in minute ventilation. So for inhaled nitric oxide, this would not be desirable or as therapeutic. The dose needs to be delivered consistent as a consistent proportion of the delivered minute volume. For nitric oxide, that dose is in parts per million, which is a proportion. So to do this, the INO system needs to monitor how much proportional nitric oxide or parts per million are going to the patient. So it can adjust its amount delivered to be proportionally consistent. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, this is just kind of an overview right now of how that, the system works. So I won't go into the indications individually, uh, but you're welcome to pause the video and look at the ones listed here. Uh, I just try to remember that whatever the specific indication, they re all revolve around improving oxygenation and or reducing pulmonary vascular resistance or pulmonary hypertension. All right, let's talk about hazards. There's a few. Uh, I'm going to go through them uh, one at a time, and then I'll list them all at the end so you can see them all together. So the first one is uh, because nitric oxide is a pulmonary vaso vasodilator, uh, certainly hypotension can be a hazard. Rebound pulmonary hypertension syndrome uh, can also be one. So you don't want to make big drops in dose when weaning your patient from inhaled nitric oxide. Worsening heart failure um, can be a hazard because if you dilate the pulmonary system, it can actually kind of increase the amount that returns to the left heart. Um, same reason like if you have a left heart fail, you don't want to turn PEEP way down uh, all in one big jump because it'll release a bunch of blood that dumps into the left heart that's already failing. So um, that would be a bad thing. All right. So think about nitric oxide going into the system and we're bleeding this into a ventilator system. So if you mix nitric oxide with oxygen, it creates a toxic gas called nitrogen dioxide, which can cause airway injury. This is not usually a problem because nitric and O2 need a lot of time to make um, nitrogen dioxide. But remember, it's one of the three things monitored through the sample line. If you want to keep uh, nitrogen dioxide levels uh, low enough to where it's kind of safe, you want to keep them uh, less than 1.5. If it's high, like if you, um, if you get a high reading above 1.5, then you can just uh, decrease the INO dose until it drops below toxic levels. 
All right. So when we bleed nitric oxide into a ventilator circuit, remember the circuit has humidity in it. And whenever you mix nitric oxide with water, you get nitric oxide, oh, sorry, not <laughs> nitric acid. And um, remember from the beginning of our presentation, that can also be found in acid rain. Pollution from combustion goes up into the atmosphere, mixes with the water, it rains out nitric acid. Well, the same thing can happen in your ventilator circuit. So you wanna make sure you keep the water out of the vent circuit. Okay, remember back at the beginning, one of the desirable things about the body's natural nitric oxide production is that it reduces platelet aggregation. So that is good for heart health, uh, circulatory health, but uh, in a hazard of inhaled nitric oxide, you know, sometimes that's not desirable and we can get some bleeding. Next, if you mix uh, nitric oxide with hemoglobin, we get what's called uh, met hemoglobin. So nitric oxide has a huge affinity for hemoglobin, about 1500 times more than carbon monoxide. So nitric oxide occupies the hemoglobin that would normally be um, bound to oxygen, which contributes to tissue hypoxia kind of the same way that carbon monoxide does, only it's more attracted to it. And met hemoglobin causes a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which causes oxygen that's on the hemoglobin to not be re released at the tissues. And that actually further contributes to tissue hypoxia. So when an, uh, an excessive amount of met hemoglobin is present, the accuracy of your oximeter to determine hypoxemia is negatively affected. Just like with uh, carbon monoxide makes an oximeter read falsely high, so does met hemoglobin. It picks up both. Actually, oximeters, normal ones pick up met hemoglobin and carbon monoxide both. So normally the level of met hemoglobin is like zero to three percent. Above three percent can cause tissue hypoxia. Uh, around 15 percent, the blood turns to a chocolate brown color. So we want to make sure we keep an eye on met hemoglobin levels and we do that through a blood sample that's analyzed by a blood gas analyzer. Uh, the blood gas analyzer can give you a met hemoglobin and a carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, a lot of times we don't pay attention to those because we're keyed into the regular numbers, but they actually do give us those values. So where I work, uh, we measure that um, every eight hours um, and we try to keep the met hemoglobin less than 5%. So if it is high, you can reduce the INO dose or you can give methylene blue, which is, uh, will bring those values down. Okay, so there's the summary of the hazards. And that wraps up this portion of our nitric oxide. Hopefully you find this helpful. Again, look for my other videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, there'll be other ones on nitric oxide and there's uh, other respiratory care topics there as well, including non-conventional ventilator modes.